Hello. Hi. It's so nice to be here. Um, I thank you for letting me uh, speak on this topic. Is this first uh, actually the first time I talk about uh, doing this kind of um, project? So I'm uh, I'm excited and a bit nervous. So um, when I was a student, um, I thought about what my life would be in the future, and uh, I was thinking I have to get a fine education to get a, a well-paying job. I, for sure, had to have a family, a wife and children, uh, perhaps a house and a dog. Um, for many people, I think, not only for me, my um, beliefs about the future was formed more about the norms of my society than uh, actually my hopes and dreams for the future. Unconsciously, we are formed by norms uh, in a large degree. In Sweden, where I come from, uh, the norm of a full-time uh, job is a very strong norm, maybe one of the strongest we have. And um, this talk is not a criticism uh, of uh, full-time work. Um, I have myself been employed uh, for seven years in a staff in a peace organization. Uh, employment in itself is not a problem. I, I'm very grateful that we have like nurses, construction workers, cashiers in supermarkets. Uh, I think we need staff also in animal rights organizations. Employment is not a problem, but the norms about employment is uh, a problem. It gets to be a problem when it limits our possibilities, when it shuts off different uh, avenues that we can take in our lives. Because the sad fact is that there are very few employment opportunities in the animal rights movement. That's why we had to create uh, these opportunities ourselves, I believe. Uh, I mean, you can work, um, have a full-time work and still work in animal rights, of course. I'm often impressed by the many people who work full, full uh, working hours and still when they get home, uh, they uh, get on with their um, volunteer work for an animal rights organization. The problem is that it's quite limited what you can do with this time. And there is also a risk for burnout since if you have all these commitments and then you add animal rights work, it can get too much. But imagine if we would be thousands of full-time animal rights workers. Imagine what we could do with all that time and all those people. Uh, with that in mind, I created uh, my project, A Year for the Animals, or in Swedish, Ett år för djuren. Uh, and um, uh, I uh, named it A Year for the Animals, since I didn't know that I was going to continue for many years. Now I'm actually in my third year, A Year for the Animals. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that uh, next year I will continue and we'll see how many years it will be in the end. So, I started with doing some videos. Uh, I thought about um, interviewing people who inspired me and who did good things for animals, like this interview with Peter Singer that I put on YouTube together with others. I took photographs of different um, animal rights activities and actions. I wrote letters to the editors about animal rights. I um, helped in a campaign, a 30-day vegan challenge with the Animal Rights Alliance in Sweden uh, that made uh, uh, non-vegans could try then vegan food uh, for a month, like in many other countries. I helped a friend with his project um, bringing um, pictures from uh, farm factory farms into shopping malls by these 50-inch TV screens. And I started uh, together with a few others, the group Empty Cages, uh, where we free animals from uh, factory farms by open rescues. That's a civil disobedience method uh, we use to take them out from the factories and into loving homes. If you're interested in this method, you can uh, see the movie uh, shown here at the conference tomorrow morning at uh, 11.30. I also um, facilitated workshops like uh, this one um, 
how to communicate with meat eaters. This is actually a photo from uh, this conference a year ago. And I helped uh, start uh, the SAVE movement in Sweden, uh, of which, which I'm the president right now. So these are some of the things I have done in my pr project so far. So now let's turn to you. I'm curious to hear why you are here. Uh, so I would like to um, put some statements out there. And if you agree with these uh, statements, uh, I would invite you to raise your hand. OK, I have three statements. The first one is, I have experience of working with crowdfunding in projects in whatever projects, can I see? Okay, quite, quite a few, maybe 10% at least. The next one, I have worked full-time for animals without employment. All right, quite a few there too, yeah, at least like seven, eight maybe. Thank you, and the last one, I would like to work full-time for animals without employment. Oh, there is quite a good majority. Thank you. Uh, and I'm so happy that you <laughs> would like to do that. Then you have come to the right, right place, I hope. Um, so, uh, this is some of the things I would like to talk about during this presentation. About this kind of project, being a full-time animal rights worker without employment. Does it fit you as a person? We'll, we'll uh, try to figure that out. Um, I have some uh, suggestions for how you can finance it. And um, I would like to talk to you a little bit about how to choose the best, best methods and activities for this kind of project. And finally, um, how could you prepare for this kind of project if you're interested uh, after this to start one? How does that sound? All right. Um, so firstly, does this kind of work fit you as a person? And um, my, uh, my possibility to answer this is quite limited, since I on really only have my own experience to draw from. from. Uh, I haven't come across many, and I'd be eager to talk to you who raised your hand that really have done this before, because I haven't met any yet <laughs> so far, actually. Uh, but uh, So I draw, draw only from my own experience. So take what I say with a grain of salt. It might not be true for you. These are mostly guesses uh, from me. But I've, uh, when I thought about it, I have some, some things that maybe makes it harder for you to pull off this kind of project, and some things that makes it easier for you to do it. So um, it's probably harder, I think, to do a full-time animal rights project uh, without employment if you don't feel really healthy. I think you need to be quite physically and psychologically healthy to pull this off, because it can take quite a lot of energy and perseverance. It is harder, probably, if you're very shy, because um, you need to get in contact with quite a lot of people to be able to do this kind of project, I think. And if it's probably harder if um, you're bad at prioritizing. And if you have a tendency to only say yes to everything, yes, thank you, and never can say no, then you will run into some problems, I think. And maybe it's a problem also if you already have many commitments that stress you out. Maybe you have children, maybe you have pets, uh, and many other such big commitments, then it could uh, make it hard to take on this kind of quite demanding jobs. It makes you also a bit more, less flexible uh, if you, for instance, want to and uh, need to take a long time on the road. Uh, it's probably harder if you have problem of accepting help or money from other people. I have met some people who are not, um, who doesn't like at all to take money from others and use money in a good way. They feel too much pressure uh, to do, do this. And now for the easier part. It's probably easier if you already are uh, an animal rights activist and perhaps have done it for quite some time. Then you already have a good network of people who share your interest and who you can work with and possibly get help from in the project. 
it's probably easier if you have grit. I don't know if you know this concept. It's from Angela Duckworth. And according to her, grit is when you have a drive, you have a, dra uh, you have a passion and a long-term commitment to work uh, towards your goals. Um, grit is actually something that we don't have or not have. It's something we can build, actually. Um, and grit is especially important in this because you don't have ex an external drive. You know, in a, in a normal job, maybe you have a boss that says you have to be finished with this until uh, next month. Maybe if you're a student, you have a teacher that says, oh, this is the deadline for the paper you're going to uh, put in. You don't have that in this kind of project, so you need to be your own drive. You have to have grit in some way. It's probably easier in this kind of project if you have uh, had an experience of running your own company before. Um, doing this kind of project is uh, quite, uh, I mean, some, some factors are quite similar of uh, doing your own company. I had experience of having my own company for seven years. I did uh, lectures and presentations and workshops in nonviolence. And in that kind of work, I uh, had to do my own website, I had to do my own schedule, I had to do promotions of my company, and so on. Uh, any such experience is good if you want to do this kind of project. So, let's say that you have decided that, yes, uh, you want to do this kind of project. You want to go ahead and start your uh, full-time animal rights activist problem, um, project. But how are you going to finance it? Uh, well, here are my top suggestions for doing just that. Um, one thing you can begin uh, with is uh, looking at your costs. How can you cut down your living costs? Um, uh, that, that's an important part, because maybe you can't uh, raise <laughs> very, very large sums of money. Uh, so, your basic, look at your basic costs. And, for instance, rent is uh, one of the big costs. At least in Sweden, that's the, one of the biggest living costs that we have. Um, so, if you can share an apartment or house with others, uh, if you can share the rent with them, that's helpful. Um, here uh, am I with my um, fellow um, friends in my community. We live in a five-room apartment in the outskirts of Stockholm. And I think it helps if you live in a city or near a city, so you have access to public transport, then you don't need a car, which is also many times um, a big expense. Uh, and uh, it makes it easier uh, to pay the rent since we're full-grown people who share it. Um, it also makes it easier if you have the possibility to have some kind of um, uh, income on the side. And I've been fortunate to have that. I continue with my company. I do much less lecturing and uh, workshops, but now and then uh, I do it. Uh, and uh, most of them are still on, on animal rights, so I can count it as part of my project. And sometimes, uh, quite often, I do it for free. Uh, but if the organizer has uh, some money, I try to get paid for it. Uh, because then I can use those uh, money f for leisure activities, like going out, having a beer, or going to the movies. That's something that I'd rather not put in my uh, a beer budget in my animal rights <laughs> project. So, <clears throat> one of the biggest things I asked myself uh, before I started this, was um, what kind of crowdfunding platform would I choose? Would I choose one of the big companies that does this? Or would I do, uh, do my own? And there are lots of them, of course. So uh, I uh, chose uh, to do my own uh, crowdfunding from my own website that I put up for my project first. Um, I made a simple Google form uh, where people who wanted to donate could fill in their names and how much they wanted to donate and what kind of perks they wanted. Uh, it was the second year of my A Year for the Animals that I tried 
Indiegogo, which is one of the biggest crowdfunding companies in the world. Uh, and um, another thing I did was that uh, I made uh, the campaign both in Swedish, my own language, and in English. And the thought was, of course, that I would reach uh, the worldwide public by having it in English and also by using this international crowdfunding site. Um, so how did, how did it go? Well, you can see here um, the Swedish contributions were quite large and only uh, quite few came from uh, abroad. And uh, the biggest part abroad was from Norway. Is it because they have so much oil they can give so much money? No, I think it was because I had been quite a little, few times to Norway to speak about what I was doing at uh, Vetchfest and so on. Um, I haven't been outside of the country that much uh, in other places. So I think these were the people who are following my activities, maybe on Facebook and so on, that knew wh what I was doing. Um, so I was thinking that, yeah, it was good to try Indiegogo, but it also cost 8% uh, of all the uh, donations I got in, including international transfers. So, in my mind, it was not worth it, not at the time at least, to try it. But new, new crowdfunding campaign, uh, I mean, platforms comes out all the time, and it could be worth looking into. I had uh, a lot of use for it because I read on Indiegogo before I started my project on how to crowdfund. And that was, uh, they had um, many things that I could take from without uh, using their platform, actually. Uh, but one good thing, uh, I mean, there are many good things, but one is that they have great statistics uh, when you use a crowdfunding platform like Indiegogo. So here you can see uh, where, uh, I mean, when the, um, uh, donations came in in my crowdfunding period. Uh, so as you can see in the beginning, that was the biggest part that came in and then quite slowly, but then in the end, a little bit there in the middle, but then in the end, a bit more. Um, so that's good to know when you have a, uh, a period of, of um, collecting money, when you think it will come in. And actually, in my third year, which is running now, the only thing I did with crowdfunding uh, to, give, uh, to get donations was to email the donors of the last two years uh, and asking them if they wanted to continue. And actually, I got everything I needed for this year just by emailing them. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> what I learned uh, maybe most from this was uh, the importance of trust. Think about it. When people give you money for a project of this kind, they put enormous trust on you. I mean, uh, you could spend it all on booze, or you could um, go on vacations, lavish uh, vacations, and they couldn't do anything about it. When they give you money, they really trust that you will use it for the animals as best as you can. So how can you build that trust? How can you make people trust you and your work? Well, I think only, uh, or uh, at least um, mainly, through showing that you are a dedicated, hardworking, compassionate animal rights activism, activist. You have to be able to show that, that you are that and you will continue, continue to be it. And one of the ways I tried to show this was to make a solid report every year of what I have done, what I had used the donor's money for. So here is a report for the year of 2016 of the activities that I've done and the result I thought it had. And now, uh, it doesn't have to build on trust, I think. Um, another way is if you have a really great idea. And it should then be a specific idea about something you want to make or accomplish. Then maybe people will get so excited by the idea that they don't have to really know you or your accomplishments from before. Sure, they still have to trust that you will uh, use the money to what actually you say you're going to use it for.
but maybe that's not uh, as important. It could be a book or a movie or a farm sanctuary or something like that, more specific that you want to make or create that uh, you think will, people, uh, will get people excited, then it might work. Uh, so I haven't been that specific when I've made the plans for what I was going to do with my years. I had some ideas I wrote down. Um, and uh, that has uh, some certain uh, advantages that maybe you can see. Because it's quite dif difficult to say what you're going to do. Uh, because it depends on how things are going to work out. So for instance, here uh, is a picture from the SAVE movement, and that's something I've been spending most of my time with this year. And uh, in, the, in last year, we had only one SAVE movement group, and I didn't know if it's going to work in Sweden. Now we have seven groups, um, and, and um, I've been spending, yeah, as I said, quite some time with that. But I didn't know how it would, would pan out, so I didn't know how much time I would spend on it. Um, yeah. What about perks? Perks are uh, things or activities that donors get uh, when they donate to your project. And um, I made some perks uh, in the two first years. So I made uh, business cards like this, with my contact info, of course, and postcards like this, uh, and uh, refrig refrigerator magnets like this, and pins. I put some on the chair. In the end, you can take some if you want to with you. Um, yeah, and also magnets like this. Um, I also have a perk that I would cook dinner for um, people who gave a certain amount of money. And um, I asked my friends, Joachim and Sara, uh, who are vegan psychologists, if they would uh, give a session on how to live uh, a vegan lifestyle, which they agreed to do as a perk in my project. I didn't uh, use any perks now the third year, and it worked out uh, well anyway. But I think it was a good idea in the first two years to make uh, the project known and to make people more committed uh, to the project. So let's say that you have made quite a lot in your project planning. You have uh, written text about what you're going to do, what the, uh, the project is about and you have made a budget, maybe a crowdfunding video, and now you're ready to reach out and uh, make the project known and, and get funding for it. And uh, of course, Facebook is one of the communication tools that are available to uh, reach out to people. And of course, it helps if you have uh, Facebook friends that, show, that shares your animal rights interest uh, these are potential donors to you, and also potential people that you can collaborate with in your project. Um, as I said, it helps if you have been active in the animal rights movement before. And I hadn't really been active very much uh, before I started my project. What I had done was to lecture and have presentations uh, on animal rights um, uh, themes. Um, I didn't know that I would do this kind of work after, but I did collect names and email addresses of the people I, um, I held uh, presentations for. And uh, this was fortunate because then I could email them uh, maybe even two years afterwards and ask, hey, now I'm, you heard this lecture, now I have this presentation. Uh, now I have this crowdfunding project, would you like to support it maybe? Uh, and uh, it was helpful to be known as an animal rights spokesperson um, when I was starting my project. And of course, there are Facebook groups you can um, show, uh, you can share your project ideas with, like here, Vegans in Sweden. You can ask others uh, on Facebook to share your project and uh, get help. And I do think it's worth time not only to focus on the activities you do, 
but also how are you going to do the crowdfunding. I think it's necessary. It, it won't work otherwise. You need to think about uh, and learn about crowdfunding, how it works, and also these other things that I have uh, talked about. Um, it's also important to show the progress of uh, your um, crowdfunding campaign, of uh, how much money uh, comes in and how close to the goal you are. And on Indiegogo, uh, you, can sh you have this automatically, of course, but it, when I did uh, my own project, I made these puzzles. So this shows how far, uh, how close I am to the goal of collecting my target, uh, target goal. How long time uh, should you spend um, collecting money? Well, I collected for a month. So I started in about in the middle of December and, started and continued into the middle of January. And I thought that it was, um, felt very good to be able to collect, and I actually managed to collect uh, everything I needed for the whole year during this month. Uh, you could, of course, collect through all through the year, have like monthly uh, givings and so on, um, if you want to. But uh, it was quite nice to leave that when I was finished with the crowdfunding and spent all the rest of the 11 months on focusing on the animals and the activities I was going to do. Of course, if you don't reach your target, uh, you can continue. You can start with the money you have and continue collecting whatever you need. Of course, there are other ways to finance. Uh, I'm certain there are funds to apply from. I, I don't uh, know so much about that. And it can differ from country to country, I'm sure. Uh, you can also um, get some money, maybe, from organizations you work with. So, for instance, now when I worked in the Save Movement, they have a budget for travels and, and things like that. So I get reimbursement if I travel for uh, the Save Movement from time to time. That's also a way. Then you don't have to budget for every cost that you will have. Uh, this is my friend Jessica, and she uh, contacted me in the end, in the beginning of my project, and she asked um, if she could uh, do a short internship with a year for the animals. So we spent a week together, uh, and that was very nice learning from each other. And she uh, does another kind of work. Uh, she works seasonally, uh, and then spend lots of time doing uh, animal rights work when she's off season. So this is what she has to say about seasonal work. I have found that combining seasonal work with animal rights activism has worked out very well. It has given me a lot of freedom. I have, for example, worked as a ski instructor and at a skydive club in Norway. When I work, I have stayed in cheap staff accommodation and I've always been able to save money. After a season of work, I am able to, do, to be very free with my time and can go to many animal rights demos, write articles, be active in groups, and make YouTube videos, which is what I mostly do. The good thing about making videos is that, that I have also been able to do that while I've been employed. So that's another way, not to do a full-time animal rights work, but do it quite a lot of time in the year. Now, I would like you to uh, maybe turn to your neighbor, if you have a neighbor where you're sitting, to talk, maybe two and three, and if you don't have one, maybe you can switch seats and find someone. Um, and uh, try to, together, um, or together with your friend uh, your, uh, who you're sitting with, uh, finish this sentence, which goes like this. If I had my own full-time animal rights project, I would do it this way. Do you understand? We'll take a few minutes to try to finish that sentence from your perspective, of course. All right? All right. <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> I didn't give you a lot of time. But I think uh, it could be like a start for something you want to continue discussing, maybe, uh, maybe tonight or, or <laughs> later. Um, so let's say that um, you have your product ready, <clears throat> you have uh, got all the money you need to uh, work for a full year with uh, animal rights. 
uh, by crowdfunding. Then comes the tricky task to choose what kind of activities and methods you will use. How will you choose um, uh, the best ones? And um, I've thought about maybe having three criteria uh, that um, guides you in this, um, in this choice. So uh, these criteria are um, passion, skills, and effectiveness. So um, if you have passion um, for something, for an idea or for a method, uh, it's more likely that you will give it a lot of energy, a lot of time, uh, compared if you're less interested in it. I think it makes sense. How about skills? Well, if you're really good at something, then you will create a better result with, uh, with that skill, of course, and that will mean better for the animals. Uh, I don't know if you recognize these fellows, but one of them is me during my childhood, and the other one is my twin brother. Can you tell who's who? <laughs> no? I hardly can tell who is who. I think that's me, yeah. <laughs> So uh, this is the very Swedish tradition of Lucia, which is actually coming from Italia, uh, Italy. <laughs> but uh, it's a singing tradition. And I'm a very bad singer. I was a bad singer. I'm still a bad singer today. Uh, I'm not going to show you. Um, and uh, for me, just for an example, it doesn't make any sense for me to use singing as a skill in my project, because I think I could be a decent singer, but it would take such a effort and time and energy for me to become a really good singer. So it makes sense for me to use some of the skills that I, I'm better at already. Um, so for instance, I, I was, a, I think, a decent photographer. I was far from a professional. Uh, but uh, I had used it before, and that was something I thought, uh, this I can use. And when I'm using it, I think I'm getting better and better. I'm, I'm still not a professional, of course, but it's something that I can use uh, effectively for the animals. So use, use what you have and, um, and improve on it, I think. We do what we do because of the animals. We care for the animals, right? So we want to help as many and as best as we can, right? Um, so I think it makes sense to think about and also listen and learn from what other has found about effectiveness. Uh, it's not an easy thing to see what methods or what activities are most effective, but I think it's worthwhile uh, our reflectiveness on this matter. For instance, I decided early on that I wanted to focus on farm animals, the, the animals we use in the food industry, because of two reasons. There are so many great in numbers, and they're suffering among the worst in, in the animal kingdom of the, of the animals that are used of humans. So for instance, I wanted to focus more on farm animals than pets, because pets uh, already are cared for by many and have a better situation. It doesn't mean that cats and dogs are unimportant. It just means that I think is I can do more for the farm and um, do more for animals by focusing on on farm animals. Talking about effectiveness, uh, I think potentially speaking to you here today can be very effective. Uh, if only one of you decided to take on a full-time rights uh, uh, a project by crowdfunding. I could double my uh, effort uh, <laughs> just by this evening. Uh, and uh, what about if many of you took on? Then we could uh, together create quite a lot of change, I think. Another thing I think it's good to do in a project like this is to go to events like this one. This is a picture from last year. Uh, to, do, to meet other, other animal rights activists and to go to VegFest or demos, uh, talk about what you're doing, and collaborate with others. One of the questions I had was, what language would I use in my project? Um, should I use my own language, Swedish, uh, or should I use English, or both? There are pros and cons about um, both, I think. 
Uh, and of course, it could be about other languages if you're other parts in the world. Uh, of course, um, uh, using your own long language, you are better equipped to use it. But I think it makes sense also for other reasons to use your language. Uh, you saw also when I collected money, it was the Swedish people, it was Swedes who also felt closest to my project and also donated more. Um, and of course I thought, well, English can reach much further. It's true. But there is already so much done in animal rights in the language of English. And maybe not so much in your language, in your country. Uh, this kind of project is not the nine to five work. You have to decide your own times. And it's crucial also to, um, to know when to stop and when to start. And also to take breaks and time off. Because we are not helping the animals if we burn out ourselves. So, uh, for instance, I um, make time, I make use of my flexible hours. So I take a break in the afternoon uh, when it's still some sunshine in uh, dark Sweden to go out for a run or do other errands. So, what can you do to prepare? If you want to do this kind of project, how can you prepare? Well, you can look at your costs. Do you have lots uh, high living costs right now? Maybe you can uh, uh, find ways to cut them already now to get used to that kind of living. Maybe you can um, practice some skills that you think you will need, like writing or photography or whatever it is you think you will um, need. And also learn more about crowdfunding or the areas that you want to focus on. Of course, being active in the animal rights movement already now, maybe you are, I, I know many people of you are already, but that the more you have uh, experience in, in uh, doing that, the easier it, it is for you to start your project. I think that um, I, together with, with you and many others, really can influence uh, this uh, world and make it better for the animals. With these kind of projects and many, many other projects, I think really we have the possibility to uh, shut down the slaughterhouse like this has been shut down many years ago and all the factory farms. Uh, and I look forward to hearing about your projects. Uh, don't hesitate to contact we, me uh, or others who have done full-time animal rights crowdfunding. Um, in the future, uh, if you have um, any questions or thoughts you want to ask. Thank you for uh, listening, and we have some time for Q&A, I think. Thank you. Yeah, just about five minutes. Do we have any thoughts? Yes, there. Thank you. Hello, thank you for your presentation. I would like to ask you for an advice uh, because I came from Latino America and we don't have still the donation culture for several reasons. So what can I do? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I actually had a slide on that. The, the culture of giving is different. For instance, in the US, I think this tradition or, or culture is pretty strong. In Sweden, it's not so strong either, but Lots of people have quite a lot of money to spend. Um, but it's a good question. <clears throat> now, I don't know Latin America, so I, I can't tell you anything about the culture, or I don't know so much. But perhaps, I mean, if the, you have great limitations within your own country, maybe you can um, turn to another country to get help. But it's a good question. Does anyone else <laughs> have advice? <laughs> maybe you. Who knows Latin America, maybe? But I know in Latin America, I mean, uh, there are money, of course, uh, if you can reach those, uh, those people, maybe. And, and I mean, for me, I mean, it's not like there are rich people, I mean, very rich people supporting me. It can be low-income people as well. If, if lots of money give a little sum, that, that can be quite a lot of money still. Yeah. But uh, maybe we can talk about that afterwards also. Yes? Yeah, uh, for people who just can't uh, have a full-time job uh, paid, I mean, um, you can also try to, with your current job, working on animal rights. 
uh, for instance, I'm a researcher working in the university and I'm actually uh, finding a classical way to get funds to make animal rights uh, research. So I'm thinking maybe about someone who is working in a shop they, they can try to uh, uh, promote uh, vegan foods or vegan uh, uh, articles. So, yeah, there is plenty of ways to, uh, to do that in your current jobs also. Yeah, thank you for that. No, I, I agree totally. You can do so much uh, within different ways, uh, yeah, living ways. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, you, uh, you said you didn't have, you, you wasn't that much around, did a lot of activism before you started with this. So uh, how was the most powerful way to reach people? Was it through Facebook or going, showing up at events and promoting yourself? Uh, I, didn't, I don't think I mentioned that. I, I had been active not in the animal rights movement, but in the peace movement. Uh, and well, I, that, you don't find so many people, uh, interestingly enough, that are both active in the peace movement and in the animal rights movement. But of course, I gained from the knowledge and experience I got from there. But what um, made a difference, I think, was these talks I had. I mean, I was, uh, when you do talks, when you have presentations in different places, your face is known, your name maybe gets known more. So if you come with a project, maybe people have heard of you, and that in itself uh, can be a help. Um, okay, so my question was about um, asking for money. So this is something that I definitely struggle with. Uh, when I'm asking people for money, I get really embarrassed. Um, although I do, um, I am doing like full-time animal rights activism, um, and I do need to start asking people for money to be able to keep doing it. So how do you how do you get over that? Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> I mean, it, I, I guess there's different answers. It's also how you do it. I, I never write personal letters like, hey, uh, Daniel, can you give me some money? I mean, like Daniel is my friend or something. I, I never do that so personally because I think that's, for me, that's a bit, I, I can't do that. It's too pushy for me. <laughs> uh, but of course, uh, when they have donated, I feel I can do that. Like you donated last year, can you consider donating again? Because then, yeah. If they have done it once, it's okay. <laughs> uh, but then I more have a more of a general question. Would you like to help me to, to help animals? That's also, I guess, one of the things. You're not helping me with anything. You're in investing in a project that will help animals. If you care about animals and, and if you think you do a good, I do a good job or reasonably a good job, maybe you can think about investing in me. So maybe that's the way how you phrase it also, and how you think about it. I, I, I'm not thinking that, yeah, you pay my rent or you pay my food. No, you pay the work I'm doing. And for that, I need food, I need uh, rent, yeah. Thank Just you. one more? Yeah. Thank you for your talk. I just wanted to uh, recommend two books in, in relation to what you said. So the first one I wanted to mention to um, regarding raising money, uh, it's a book called The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. Many of you probably have heard of him. He's quite popular in the interpretation He's an entrepreneur, and basically he talks about many ways that we can just create a steady inflow of money that will liberate our time. And the second book I wanted to recommend is in reply to the question about accepting donations. It's a book by a musician called Amanda Palmer, and it's called The Art of Asking. She also has a very famous TED Talk um, on this subject, so I hope this is useful. Thank you. Great suggestions. Okay, unfortunately, we don't have any more time, but can I get the two sheets that we passed out for sign up? Did it go all the way around? Okay. Thank you. And I'm here the whole week, so if you want to discuss any of this or any matters, please uh, just get me in the week. Thank you. Thank you.